Hey, hey there. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Welcome back. It's another Red Pill Religion podcast. Red Pill Religion, among the many things we say, are that religion and politics always go together. Uh, left and right are on a shell game, but religion and politics cannot be separated. They simply can't be. So if you like the kind of work we're doing here on Red Pill Religion, uh, in Red Pill Religion, please give us a like, please give us a subscribe and hit the bell, and please check us out on redpillreligion.com. We're on our third channel after having been chased all over youtube we're still alive now here on this channel and and doing a little better so please let people know about the new channel location and if you like the kind of work we're doing please remember uh, in these days of social media censorship you'll always find us on redpillreligion.com where we would also appreciate it if you would hit that patreon well not patreon so much but if you would hit that paypal subscribe star button the bitcoin donation button or buy some of our merchandise we would sure appreciate it and in any case come on by redpillreligion.com every day every day we got articles and videos and other good stuff find us on gab at red pill religion find us on dissenter as red pill religion we've recently joined defend dissenter we're on me we we're definitely on subscribe star so we'd love to see you there also today is in fact monday and for the next uh, month or three we will be still here with our friend every monday John C. Wright, science fiction author John C. Wright. Say hello to the people, John. Hello, people. All right. And I said, if you, everybody, before before you do anything else, please go to scifiright.com. Scroll down. You'll see he's put up a nice announcement for our show tonight, but also there's stuff going on. on it. What's going on on your blog? Tell us all about it. Uh, uh, Brian Nehemiah, a friend of mine, has just come out with a new book, and I was trying to boost his signal and see if I could get him a few sales. And if you scroll down below that, you will see... Uh, an article complaining about what the hor what horrible things Disney is doing to my my favorite space princess. And if you go scroll down one or two more, you'll see Lost on the Last Continent, a free novel that I am putting out one chapter at a time over the last year. So at the end of the year, there will be 52 nice, neat little uh, uh, well, excuse me, two, two years. This one's going to be more like 80, uh, 80 or 90 chapters long. I also have book reviews, such as uh, our, our, our story reviews, like uh, Conan's Iron Shadows of the Moon. I also, if you scroll up, you can see I make commentaries about the interesting and deep issues of the day and of all time, which is the uh, Nine Insanities, uh, uh, down a bit again, Nine, nine Sins and Insanities, where I a, uh, uh, try to commit a, uh, a vivisection on what is wrong with the, uh, with the modern world. And it was because I was working on that essay that I thought that uh, discussing what's wrong with the world might be a useful topic for this evening. Yeah, it might indeed. In fact, we're going to talk about how to fix the world tonight because there's nothing like two middle-aged science fiction nerds to tell everybody how to run the world. Oh, but no, no, no. I was much more humble than that. I wasn't going to tell you what was wrong with it. <laughs> you got you to identify the problem first. There you go. And by the way, shout out to Brian Niemeyer. He's a great guy. We've had him on the show a few times. Probably will again. I hadn't. Uh, please do support his uh, new book, Combat Frame Exceed Coalition Year Forty. Brian Niemeyer. And by the way, special bonus points if you can spell Niemeyer right the first time, because I never have. He's a great guy. So, and he's a good author. Please check him out. Um, and then when you're done checking him out, please also be sure to check the works page on John C. Wright's Sci-Fi Wright blog, where you can get links to all of the fiction he has ever published. Um, many of them award-nominated, award-winning, uh, well-received by fans. He's an old-school science fiction writer, uh, science fiction and fantasy writer, in addition to having, uh, we, we forgive him for the fact that he used to be a lawyer um, and, and a newspaper man, but he writes great science fiction in the fantasy. So well, I turned from, I turned from the legal profession to journalism to science fiction author because I found that my skill at making up lies and deceptions had proved so useful. I thought I could turn it to the greater glory of God rather than serving the devil. So <laughs> making up fake stories. Yeah, I got, I got gotcha, you. I got, I was, gotcha. I was one of the few, uh, newspaper guys who didn't make up fake stories. And I, Went into bankruptcy doing it, but I was, uh, you know, I was, I was a crusader. <laughs> I've been a crusading journalist too. You're lucky you still have a job at all. <laughs> I don't have a job in journalism. I got That's out of that racket. Yeah, good point. Good point. They, they, they do take you out if you, if you cover the wrong stories the wrong way. I know a few. But anyway, uh, so tonight, actually, we wanted to talk about what, we, what do we say the show title is? What's wrong uh, with the world and why? Atheists can't fix it. Or did we say secular humanism? 
We said secular humanists. Well, I think what we said was secularism, humanism, and atheism cannot fix things because they all kind of go together now, don't they? In fact, you had a quote that you thought might help us from, uh, let's see, and, and, and it is in the low bar. By the way, our, our, our stuff is all in the low bar too. Check it out. But this is a University um, of Pennsylvania art, uh, excuse me, history professor Alan Charles Coors. Do you want me to read it or do you want to read it? Go for it. You go ahead and read Mr. Core's statement. The pathology of Western intellectuals has committed them to an adversarial relationship with the culture, free markets, and individual rights that has produced the greatest alleviation of suffering, the greatest liberation of want, ignorance, and superstition, and the greatest increase of bounty and opportunity in the history of all human life. He here is saying, in case the grammar is unclear, that the culture of free market and individual rights has produced all these great things, not that the adversarial relationship produced these things. This pathology, meaning the pathology of being opposed to the West and all its, all its bounties and all its blessings, this pathology allows Western intellectuals to step around the Everest of bodies of the victims of communism without a tear, a scruple, a regret, an act of contrition, or a reevaluation of self, soul, or mind. I thought that was a brilliant quote because I think it needs to be translated slightly from the intellectual language of Professor Coors plain and straightforward talk. When he says the Western intellectuals, he means the atheists, the secular humanists, the, uh, the progressives, the, uh, uh, the, the modern materialists. The pathology, yeah. the atheist, commits them to an adversary relationship with the culture. When he's talking about the culture, he means Christendom. It is, it is the Christian West, the culture of Europe and of America, that produced all these things, free markets, individual rights, and the blessings that flow therefrom. Free markets and individual rights don't spring out of nowhere for no reason. And those things, in turn, spring out of theism. You don't, if you don't believe in the supernatural, you can't believe in God. If you don't believe in God, you can't believe that man is made in the image of God. If you don't think man is made in the image of God, you don't really have a good reason to believe that, that poor, stupid people who are your enemies have the same rights you do, the same natural, innate rights you do. And if you don't have that belief, that actually a mystical belief in, in human rights, you can't have free markets, you can't have liberty, you can't, and you can't have all the blessings that, that flow from that. Being, believing in rights is ultimately a mystical belief, isn't it? Because it's not based in any empirical evidence. It's mystical. Because look at look at your neighbor, look at your world, look at yourself. Are you as smart as Einstein? No. Why do you have the same rights? Are you as good an athlete as uh, your favorite basketball player, your favorite uh, football player? No. No, you're not as strong or fast as they are. Are you as morally competent as I don't know the guy the guy working at the homeless shelter or? Uh, the uh, the nun working in India among the among the lepers. No, your morality has doesn't have a patch on them. So in what sense are you in what sense are you equal? In what sense are you worthy of respect? You don't have the I mean you don't have the wealth and the power of a famous political figure. You don't have the money of a millionaire. You don't have uh, you know as many women as a as a rock star. So what is it? It's not so it can't be any material property like intelligence or or, well, yes. Uh, moral code or what have you. It's got to be something that's that's even in a baby. All right, but let me let me point out the uh, one of one of the okay. Maybe I'm not trying to. This, this might get us in the right direction or not. Let's see. But I had to notice that this quote you pulled is from the Atlas Society, which is from uh, uh, some object Ayn Rand objectivists, and and I I myself have. have never been a big fan of objectivism ever, um, although it, it's not completely without any merits. Um, uh, what I find interesting is, is there somebody, in a, well, there's somebody to say, in an objectivist forum, somebody posted this article and this comment, and I just mm -hmm. want to scream at this guy, you're objectivists, you're a bunch of atheists, your ideology is just as bad as the rest, because to me, the objectivists and other atheist philosophers have also chipped away at the West. Um, They've chipped away from another direction. It's true, but they haven't chipped away at its heart. They want to. They're just. They're just spoiled brats. They want to keep the, the fruits of the Western intellectual tradition without the religion that creates the Western intellectual tradition. Whereas the, their enemies, who are also our enemies, which is why I like objectivists. In a foxhole, your you know your worst enemy is your best friend if he's firing against the enemy. Their enemy is our enemy, which is the the, the culture of socialist, secular humanist materialist atheists who, even though the objectivists are also atheists, the socialists want to eliminate the fruit of Western 
uh, of the Western uh, intellectual tradition, not just the not just the roots. Yeah, I think they even miss the fact. I believe this is rooted in Aquinas and other Christian thinkers. Actually, yeah, I think yeah, even yeah. Uh, even uh, even uh, well, I mean free markets. Uh, even oh, yeah, even, oh, yeah. even Stephen Molyneux was recently who is a an atheist libertarian sort of objectivist libertarian guy. Yeah. Stephen Molyneux was saying he was sh well about a year ago. He said he was shocked when he learned that the the whole idea that value uh, I forget what the exact phrasing is. But I mean, it was an economic principle that goes back to Aquinas and other uh, great Christian thinkers was that well, within economics, value is ultimately, uh, in terms of economic value, I mean, is ultimately subjective. They're, they're, yes. Uh, in the Middle Ages, they used to debate if gold is more precious in the market than iron, why is it that if you had all the iron in the world, that would be more precious than all the gold in the world? Because all the iron in the world, you can't build anything. Weapons... Uh, towers, you know, you can't build anything without iron. See, so if iron is more useful to man, why is gold of higher value? And the conclusion they came to was that the market is an expression of the human will, is an expression of the human sovereignty over the earth. That it was our sub, it was the subjective theory of value. The that subjective sharp, theory of value. Thank that you. Is that is a was sharp it. contradistinction to the Marxist theory, which unfortunately he got from Adam Smith. It's one of Adam Smith's few blunders, but it was a terrible blunder. He has the labor theory of value, which says the value of a product is equal to the number of man hours that you put into making it. Now, the labor theory of value, I have to say, is absurd on its face, as is all of Marxism. Because according to the labor theory of value, if I spend a thousand hours uh, uh, feeding the poor or building a tower or painting a picture or developing a new form of steam engine that runs off of butterfly smoke, that is not worth as much as someone who spends 2,000 hours making a giant radioactive statue of a dead dog in the middle of the Gobi Desert. Right. Because he's just he spent more time at his effort than I've got my, my effort, so his is more valuable. Well, that's ridiculous. No one, no one wants to buy that statue. They might buy the, they might buy the butterfly car, though. It, it, is, it is not obvious to any human, unless you just kind of grew up in this, that value is entirely subjective. That, 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 the economic value, I mean. Yeah. Uh, although there's there's worries about that because I mean really if you think about it well shouldn't gold uh, be less valuable than iron you can't do as much with gold it's not as useful but gold, it's gold, just pretty but it's more valuable for other reasons that's uh, right it's it's identifiable it's always in demand it's uh, fungible it's divisible and it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't rust. rust it doesn't rot or rust so its use as a currency far out yeah. a, a way of storing value over time. And it's pretty. Outweighs, well, the fact that it's pretty means it's always in demand as ornaments. Yep. Now, but the fact that humans like it as ornaments, I mean, if we were a different type of creature or just had different tastes, we wouldn't we wouldn't care about it. You know, we don't care. Tin used to be a uh, used to be an ornamental uh, a metal because it was so rare. It's still it's shiny. The but idea. Not anymore. The idea that every individual uh, has a right to some sort of property. Even I mean, yeah. might, not, I mean, property not necessarily means of land, but like, this is my this is my shirt. The fruits this of your own my, labor. These are, yeah, these are my these are my shoes, not yours. You can't just take them. This, yeah. These these you know, um, that too is is in many ways rooted in the Christian West. Now here's uh, what's interesting about that. Uh, uh, Adam Smith, as you can see, I've studied economics. <laughs> Adam Smith uh, derives that he merely takes that as a given, whereas Thomas Aquinas says. This is a side effect or, or a logical deduction from the fact that God gave man sovereignty over the earth. Everyone has sovereignty over the fruits of his own labor because he because man is allowed to own things. He's allowed to own property. Animals don't. No animal owns property. I mean, okay. birds, birds have nests, but they can't sell them. They can't trade them to other birds. Right, and, yeah. and, and of course, if a, one bird steals another's nest, there's no court of appeal. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, they might fight. Um, they might fight. They might fight. So the thing is, is that these, uh, all of these actually, they seem obvious to everybody because we grew up in a culture that respects them. Although they're all, they're also, respect for these is going too. And I think that that goes because uh, what, what, Frankly, what atheist economists, like a lot of the libertarian thinkers, not just the objectivists, but mm -hmm. Hayek and quite a few of the others, they, 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 
this is a bone I often have to pick with libertarians too, even though I'm often allied with them on certain things. Yeah. They try to take God completely out of the picture. And, and, and by taking God out, any idea of God, it doesn't even have to be a Christian idea of God. Right. That's, that's the best way to go. But you, 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 some, even just a vague platonic idea of God, you take that out, everything gets reduced to radical subjectivity, including moral lessons. And to get right. back to Adam Smith, I will mention, and this is something that annoys some people when I mention it, but I mean, Adam Smith said the markets would turn evil without a strong moral sense. And, and moral people governing it. And he had other things to say about, you know, what should right. happen within a free market, including one of the things that hits my heart and makes people think I'm a socialist when I'm not. He railed against the whole idea of absentee ownership. He said, if you're running a business and you're, you're never there, you're terrible. And that's a terrible thing for the for, for the well, he saw, he saw that he saw the horrors that went on with the absentee landlords of, of British landlords uh, owning land in Ireland. What basically happened is they wasted the land, and because the owners were were absent, the, the market couldn't operate. To to there was no the normal feedback mechanism that happens in the market, so that prices adjust and pe and property goes to where the the majority of, of uh, uh, consumers and producers want it to go. That that mechanism that that set of checks and balances can be slowed or stopped either by absentee landlords or Adam Smith. Free market guy though he was talked about the tendency of manufacturers whenever they got together to conspire to all raise prices to uh, you know to he talked yeah. about the, the the possibility of uh, trusts and, uh, and monopolies though he didn't use those those terms I don't come into use yet no but I mean he did and he talked about you know people owning land or businesses that you know like right. they they live in France and own these things in England. No, uh, the and you have, the thing is in a in a let me just make this point. Sure, go ahead. Go ahead. It, 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 well, what I would call a functional free market, which I don't think we've had for a long time, um, and a functional free market, the business owner is a respected member of the community, maybe even feared or resented, but uh, he has to actually look at the people who he employs or who live on his land. Uh, they know where he lives. Um, mm -hmm. if, he, if he's a good man, they'll see him in church on Sundays. Um, and that becomes an accountability thing, whereas we have turned everything over to faceless bureaucracies, either government bureaucracies or, I would argue, very artificial corporate entities, uh, transnational corporate entities that don't, you know, the people owning, like, even a big company like, let's say, Comcast, the world's biggest internet service provider, um, nobody can tell you who owns Comcast or make them accountable. Yeah. Uh, the managerial class moves in and out. Nobody knows who they are. Um, I'm not picking on that company. I just pulled them as a random example. Please don't think I'm, well, nobody likes Comcast, but, <laughs> but I'm not necessarily picking on except, that company. Except when we want, except when we want computer service. Uh, here's, here's, the thing, here's, my, here's my beef with uh, libertarians, which, and I'm going to parallel it to, I'm going to draw it back to what you were just talking about, because I also agree with that point. Uh, fervent, uh, fervent pro free market guy that I am, I also agree that if you make the free market into an idol, if you don't have a god to set to be at the top of your pyramid of values in your mind, then something else is going to be at the top of the pyramid. And if the free market is at the top of the pyramid, as it is with objectivists, the idea the idea of, of perfect human liberty governed by human reason is is the is the top value of their hierarchy. Everything is based on the idea of a non-aggression principle, where as long as you do no harm to another man. And anything you do is within your is within your jurisdiction, within your liberty. That becomes an idol when you're dealing with people who are corrupt, because the free market will operate with a slave market, with a market in pornography, with a market in in uh, drugs and alcohol that that waste people's lives, sex with a market in, in in a gambling, with a market in drunk gambling sex slaves who waste your lives. Uh, with any kind of market, the the rules of economics are still going to operate. And the and the the market will deliver to the most people what they most want at the at their highest priority. But if their wants are wicked and vicious, then the the, the mob, the the consumers, the producers, are going to produce and consume wicked, vicious things. And and not not only that, the the market doesn't have it has some corrective mechanisms, but it doesn't have but it's not a perfect self-correcting uh, mechanism. You have to have someone to, to, to punish fraud. You have to have someone to punish when people break their contracts. But you also have to have someone to punish uh, uh, negligence. 
or or uh, manufacturing of shoddy goods or uh, uh, now let me draw this back. The reason why you need the reason why you need these other mechanisms outside of the free market, you need a culture to support it. A yep. culture where, by and large, people of their own will are not willing to break a contract. They're men of they're actually men of honor. They're not they're not shady businessmen, but they're actually honest businessmen who who either regard it as a divine duty or as a social duty not to cheat their customers, even though they'll never see that customer again, even though they could, even though they could, they could squelch that guy easily. See, without that kind of culture, without that kind of attitude, you can't have the trust relationships you need to have a free market because a free market is almost always strangers dealing with strangers. And the things you mentioned where the landlord lives on the land that he, that he lords it over, where he goes to the same church as the peasants, where he, he rubs shoulder to shoulder with uh, with everyone else. Those are all mechanisms of feedback where he can't he can't uh, deny what he's seeing with his eyes, he, and he can't he can't avoid being confronted if he is is violating the things that are more fundamental to society than the free market. The problem with libertarian is that libertarians try to make the free market fundamental to society, and it is not. It is a byproduct of something deeper. Yes, and if you and switch I... those two. You just get you just basically will get an anarchy. Let me say one other thing real quickly. A specific example aside from Comcast that I can speak of from my uh, newspaper days, and you might be able to. I don't know how when you were in the newspaper business or if you were in it when it was changing, but I was in it uh, right at the time when our our advertising staff was about as big as our staff to go out and find stories. And the reason why is because our ads were local. We had to go to the local businesses and ask for local money to get the local ads to put in the local paper. OK, nowadays, even small papers, even small town papers go to large, faceless international corporations and say, give us uh, advertising. Uh, um, uh, we'll sell you advertising space. You advertise in our paper and uh, your your uh, advertisers and our readers have no feedback with each other. In other words, if the reader is offended by a lie he finds in the newspaper, he can't. He can't call the local butcher shop that's advertising in the paper and say, "This guy, you, you, the paper you're 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 advertising is lying." Yep. I mean, who are you going to call? Are you going to call Disney? Are you going to call uh, gonna Bank call of America? Anybody. I've had that experience. Yeah. I, shit, crap! I had I had a woman. Uh, a report. Now that's a failure of the free market. I'm sorry that that, that that's a byproduct of the free market, but that is that is that is a a, a, a uh, that's like disconnecting the brakes on a car that's in motion. Okay. There's now now the newspapers have no financial incentive not to lie their asses off. Pardon my language. And they do. And they do. And they do. Uh, in fact, they have a fi they have financial to in they have financial incentive to lie. Um, yep. And 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 by, by I've I've known any number of reporters and former reporters in my time, and believe you me, if you won't lie for the advertisers, you will not work in the mainstream media. It simply will not happen or you'll work there for a little while and then as soon as you do as soon as you're a problem You will be gone um, there, there are no more working journalists in the mainstream media um, And I don't want to make it all about that because let's let's go let's go back to this issue That is a main but, but that is a main problem with what's wrong with the world because uh -huh. the journalists in the old days used to have a high standard They regarded what they did as a vocation the same way the priest regards what he does as a vocation as if they had a duty of honor to tell the truth to the public. Can you imagine any of these ridiculous, uh, uh, lying uh, prevaricators of the modern of the modern media industrial complex, the modern lying complex, the modern the, the matrix? It's just a matrix of lies that where they expend infinite efforts to maintain what they call a narrative, a false picture of the universe, merely to ensnare the unwary, merely to entrap their victims. Can you imagine any of them saying, oh, no, no, I would rather lose my job than print a falsehood in the paper. But people in the old days, back when the country was a little more Christian, used to do that. Now, not everyone, never, not every individual has to be Christian, but he has to believe in some higher power. He has to believe in something higher than human law, because whatever human law says can be done, human laws can say can be undone. So I don't care if you're Christian or not Christian. If you don't believe in something bigger than man, if man is your measure for all things, then when man is evil, your measure is evil. Yes, yes. And, and okay, so we're both a little more sympathetic with libertarians, but I would say the biggest libertarian error is putting the dollar, or money more generally, where God's supposed to go. 
Yeah, and I think that the the the, the driving. Well, no, no, no. Let's be fair. They, they, let's be fair. They put they put liberty where God is supposed to go. They actually put a good thing where God is supposed to go. They put human reason and human liberty where, where God is supposed to go. Well, and, what, and and their love of money is just a, is just a side effect of that. Yeah, but then, see, once they get power, if they still think that way, it goes exactly where you just suggested. It becomes all about the money and never about the morals. Because moral questions, well, if, if you don't believe there's a God or any ultimate morality, uh, uh, there's no such thing as a sin, really, then uh, really, why shouldn't I, you know, uh, rapaciously destroy well, the land? Be fair. The be, people? Fair. be fair. All the objectivists that I know believe that there's that they can deduce a moral code from man's rational nature and say, you have to treat other people as if they're reasonable, and you have, can't cheat them, or attack them, or kill them, or or, or even lie to them. Yeah. All this, and I I agree. You can deduce maybe six or seven of the Ten Commandments just from human reason, and that's that's why, and the only reason why their philosophy has the appeal it does, because it will cover ninety percent of the cases. But still, the, case that, the cases it doesn't it doesn't cover is what if there's a financial interest in you in you covering up the truth? What if someone's paying you to lie? What if there's an emergency? What if there is a scarcity of resources and during the emergency there's no time or chance for the free market to operate? What, what if, if there's just what if there's just a big pile of cash sitting there waiting for you to make that one moral compromise? And you can think of 30 good things that might come out of that moral compromise. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I but, but the, the thing being the problem. problem. Let me just make this one, John. Yep. Uh, when you make the moral com when whenever you make a moral compromise, let me just point this out to the audience. Whenever you make a moral compromise, you can always think of a bunch of reasons why it'll be good for you to do it anyway. You can always do it. Now, uh, so. the other thing is, I've never known a libertarian or an objectivist. They may be out there. I don't know all of them, but I knew a lot of them who said that adultery was wrong, who said divorce was wrong. Certainly, none of them said contraception was wrong, and obviously, it is. You know. None of them. None of them were able to, from the from the standpoint of enlightened self-interest. A, humans aren't enlightened enough for that to be enough. And B, what are you going to rely on in an emergency? There you are behind enemy lines. The shells are falling all around you. You come across a guy in a shallow grave that everyone else thinks is dead, and you see his fingers twitch. And you know that if you try to carry him back to over the line, that you might die. Whereas if you sprint and run for it and leave him behind, you'll live. And you don't know him. He's not awake. You don't have any deal with him. He doesn't hire you to be his bodyguard. What is a libertarian going to rely on in that moment of crisis when he is weak and he might die? And uh, no one's around and there's no one to see. What are you going to do? What, what really is going to be in the core of your heart that will be so invulnerable that you can resist the really obvious temptation? That would appeal to that would appeal to anyone at that moment. Yes, absolutely. In and fact, I, that I, whole I, idea I, of I, honor. I would, I would, I would honor. The glory. If I was in that situation, are you kidding me? A terrible situation. I've said it before, but young men, especially that I talk to, do not know what honor and integrity mean. And and the the, the closest summation of the one sentence I've ever I've used that nobody can has ever been able to argue with is integrity is doing the right thing when nobody's looking, yeah. and when you know you could get away with something. That's what integrity and not doing it. Um, that's what integrity is. And that requires you to have an idea that there is an ultimate right and wrong rooted in something beyond human, beyond human capacity to rationalize, beyond human capacity to justify, beyond human capacity to do anything except I know this is right and this is wrong. What we said earlier is if I'm in that situation I just described and I see the, I see the guy in the shallow grave and his fingers twitch and I know he's still alive. If I have a mystical, unprovable belief that his soul is precious, that he has human rights that are the same as mine, and that I don't, I should not leave him to die in the ditch any more than I would want to die in the ditch myself, then I have a reason to stoop and to carry his heavy body and to drag it and to drag it back to safety, even at the expense of my, own, even at the the risk to my own life. But if I don't believe in that mystical bond between us, that the brothers are strangers. What's going to motivate me? Now, I don't, no, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying a guy, a guy like Stephen Molyneux could not come up with a very logical-sounding argument why, in the theory, in the abstract, you ought to help a, a wounded stranger. Okay? I'm saying that that, if it doesn't speak to your heart and your soul, if you don't even believe you have a soul, 
you're not going to find the strength you need when all the chips are down. And the same thing is true for a free market. If the free market is not based on a mystical sense of honor among businessmen who believe that labor is a sacrifice to God, or don't get me wrong, you don't have to, doesn't have to be Christian. If they, if, they, if they don't believe that there is someone watching when no one else is watching, okay, the ghost, the spirit world, if they don't believe that there's a that there's a code of conduct that's more important than making money, then they're going to sacrifice the code to the money. They will sacrifice their code to the money. And although some of them may be may die fat, rich, and happy laughing, uh, I, I think most of them will turn into Ebenezer Scrooge one way or the other. Um, and we'll either change or we'll turn into Philip Marley, die as Philip Marley. That's but, a reference but, but, to the, but here's the whole point of that story. Philip Marley yeah. did die fat, rich, and happy. Yep. But then he found out that that there's a, that that's not the whole story. If you believe that life and death is the whole story, then why not be a socialist? Because the socialist and libertarian are two are two sides of the exact same coin. They the are. Is a radical individualist, a radical for capitalism, yep. and the socialist is a radical uh, a collectivist. That turns us straight to the other side, flip side of the coin. Very good. The libertarians have some things right. And by the way, uh, because it makes some people upset, so socialists are not without any good ideas at all. Not, because their uh, lies would not be convincing if there was totally lying. Yep. They say they're going to uphold the, the poor and the weak and the, and the downtrodden. That's what their claim is. Yep. Now, do they do that? Can they solve the problem of poverty? Was poverty solved in the Soviet Union? Are there no more poor people in, in China? Well, let me tell you. I went to China once, and I was in the tourist section. Okay, I was in the nice part of China where they clean things up for people, but it's still communist. It's still communist society, and there were people begging. I was the only guy who gave money to the beggars. He said, "Well, I gave money," and, and my tour guide couldn't understand why I would give money to a beggar. He asked me why I did that. I said, "I said uh, I believe that my God disguises himself from time to time as a beggar and wanders the streets of of the world." And anyone who is not kind to, to them here on earth will, will be condemned by him in the, uh, in the afterlife. So yeah. I, mean, I, just, I, I tried to boil the story down to his level so he could understand what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. and it was purely mystical. I, I'm never going to see those guys again. I didn't know their names. It wasn't even money. It wasn't even my system of money. I was giving them yen. <laughs> okay. <laughs> The, the 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 socialist answer often often actually starts out well, seeming extremely well, rational. It really does. Before your next, before your next comment, let me, let me let me emphasize the the punchline of that of my story. My tour guide, who was a a guy who spoke perfect English and who knew about the West, could not understand my motive. Huh. This society had no had no concept for me helping the poor as to why I would do that. Right. Why would you? Why would you? They're poor. They're nasty. They're whining all the time. They always right. need things. They're and holding their hands out. They're clutching at you. They smell bad. Why would you even go near the them? Party, and the party says that they're going to take care of them. The, the, the communists say they're going to take care of all the poor. So the individual has no responsibility to do so. Yeah, yeah. They can, they can, they can have their government flunkies do it. Yeah, the, the socialist position starts out sounding rational. They say, listen, right. this money thing, it's really just symbolic. And we've allowed some people to accumulate more of these symbols than others. And we're good people, and we care about each other, and we want to help each other. And right. so far, not exactly wrong. But then it becomes who's going to decide what the priorities are. And who's going to get help first and second? And who gets to help decide who gets to help right. when? And 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 it begins to go awry from there, especially because when you have no ultimate authority, nothing beyond human power to appeal to, mm -hmm. and even within a socialist system, even somebody who starts out really meaning it, I want to help. I want to help children uh, sure. uh, be fed properly. Um, I want to do that. And they really, 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 really mean it, too. It ultimately winds up, because nobody's got anything to appeal to, it winds up still being a sort of Darwinian process of who's got the most will to power within your socialist system. Because who's the one who's going to say what's right and what's wrong, what's right for, the, for humanity and what's wrong? It'll be a person or a committee. There's a law of economics called Gresham's Law, which says that bad money drives up good money. And that's, that's reflecting the fact that if there's two currencies uh, circulating in a, in a given marketplace, the money that they don't trust to retain its value, a person will try to spend quickly, 
and the money they trust, the currency they trust to keep its value, they will tend to put in their pocket because they want to store value against against a rainy day tomorrow. And so, so consequently, ironically as it sounds, the less reliable money is the one that most people are circulating in the economy. The circulation of the bad money draw, goes up, and the circulation of the good money goes down because it, it, people start to hoard it. Similarly, there's a rule that no one has ever, no socialist ever seems to recognize, that the honest, sincere, hardworking socialists who actually just want to help the poor and the downtrodden get replaced by the gangsters, the thugs, the looters, the moochers, with, with all due respect to Ayn Rand, uh, that's her terminology. Uh, and, and she, well, uh, and she should know, by the way, she escaped from the Soviet, from yeah. the Soviet, uh, Russia, uh, and, and by the murderous tyrants. Now, why is that? Why, why, why did good people get replaced by the wicked people in a, in a situation like that, but not necessarily in a place like, like America? I'm not saying there's not a tendency. I'm not saying we haven't had, you know, good people driven away from, from a, a certain institution by wicked people or, or so on and so forth. It does happen. But it doesn't happen to the degree, it doesn't happen in one generation where, where uh, Trotsky gets, gets uh, uh, savaged by Stalin and airbrushed out of pictures and all of the Trotsky followers are lined up against the wall naked and shot in the head at point blank range. I mean, they, they go from, they go from sweetness and light to murders really quickly. If, if I may use a, a rather disturbing metaphor, I don't know if you or any of your listeners has had an experience of having someone either in your family or a close friend, uh, go insane, actually had develop a mental disease and slowly lose their reason. But they start out at first sounding perfectly reasonable. No. And they, there's just one or two things that kind of obsess them. And at first it's just an, an, an eccentricity. And you just go, oh, that's just, you know, Uncle George. And, and then the eccentricity gets to be larger. It, it, it swells. It starts to absorb more and more of Uncle George's life. And he gets more and more hectic and irrational and, and disconnected from everything else. And then slowly even normal things are just abnormal around him. Everything is slightly off kilter. Everything is slightly slanted or, or doesn't make a right angle. It is, it is, and everything touches, everything, all parts of his life. Well, that's what happens when a person is cut off from sanity. Yeah. When they're cut off from their rational faculty that, that puts the puts the brakes on where the, before, you know, before they go too far. And, and uh, uh, with, a, with a socialist, a socialist is basically the philosophical equivalent or the economic equivalent of an insanity, where you take one or two really alluring ideas like, wouldn't it be wonderful if all human institutions were abolished and suddenly and for no reason a utopia sprang out of nowhere for no reason of nothing? And they say, that's, a, that's my scientific theory of, of how history works, because I'm a scientific socialist. And by taking money away from everyone and by, by destroying the price system of all goods and services in the economy and running everything by a quota system, I, we can then create widespread abundance for everyone. By creating, nothing but dis, by creating nothing but disincentives to labor, we will get more labor out of everyone. Now, it sounds crazy when I say it that way, but that's only the end result of their beginning crazy. And the cultural Marxists are the same way. They start by saying, we must treat all people with equal respect and equal rights. And every red-blooded American will say, well, of course, that certainly makes sense. And then they say, uh, well, this minority and that minority has been treated unfairly in the past. Maybe we should give them a, a leg up and give them a little extra help because the, you know, the system's kind of, the, the playing field's not level. It's kind of slammed against them. And most red-blooded Americans will say, yeah, well, I, I think that's, I, I don't see anything really wrong or evil about that. And then they say, oh, and by the way, now the czar in charge of making sure that everyone's completely equal says that men who think they are women who wear dresses can go into your schoolgirl's locker room and wrestle against their wrestling matches in, in school in the school teams and can join the Girl Scouts and be alone in pup tents with girls who think they're girls. And, and you suddenly realize, wait a minute, what, what? And then the person says, well, you can't use pronouns anymore. The form of speech known as a pronoun is now forbidden. You have to use the pronouns we say. But let's. Uh, let's then you're then you're insane. <laughs> okay. That's why you're, the, the things you're saying, females are males and males are females. 
is not it, it started from saying let everyone have equal rights which is which is good and then it gets to a crazy then it gets to crazy land it does especially because without some idea of god you have no ultimate sense of what's what right. rights are in the begin right. with let's let me let me let me kind of summarize this because I still think there's a tendency among a lot of us, and I still fall for it sometimes too. Like I see Same in the comments is mentioning all these uh, mass murders and atrocities by communists. He mentions that people forget that before Stalin murdered a bunch of people, Lenin mil murdered millions of people. And many more, than the, many more than the German Holocaust, I should just mention. Uh, we have so many movies and <laughs> comic books where the Nazis are the bad guys, but where, are, where is the Schindler's List for Gulag Archipelago? Where are any of Solzhenitsyn's novels been made into a movie? Where are the just the guys who were killed in China in one year of the Cultural Revolution? Where are the monuments to them? But let's uh, let, let's go back to why because this is supposed to be about why godlessness can't fix things because and godless ideologies can't fix things they can't. I'm going to go back and I'm going to pick on some capitalists some more, some so-called capitalists. I'm going to reference a book that I actually think a lot of people, including a lot of conservatives, should read called The New Confessions of an Economic Hitman. Now, John, this isn't fair because you haven't heard about it, but I'll, I'll summarize briefly. This is a real man. I mean, a real guy who was, I mean, his book was favorably reviewed in the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times. And he really, you know, he's done all the things he says he's done. He's legitimate. It was a New York Times bestseller, in fact, called The Confessions of an Economic Hitman. It's a very, uh, very riveting read simply because, hey, this man is godless and he, go, he came up with a bunch of godless people. He really did. I mean, you even read through his stuff and he still has no such sense, right? He still kind of thinks th in things of more in economic and materialist terms than anything. But his job for decades was uh, in the name of capitalism, working for banks and corporations to go into countries and destroy them. Um, and he did so in more than one. Um, uh, using the power of international banks and international uh, corporate interests. And really, uh, he's not a socialist. He's no commie. He just goes into all the things that people, all it, the it things. May, it may not be fair, but I hope you're not going to ask me to defend the international banking system as if that's a free market. Well, I regard, I regard them. I regard them as the gnomes of Zurich combined with the Illuminati. They're, yeah, they're, they're yeah. the farthest thing from the free market I can think of. They're the new world order. Well, yeah, bankers, 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 very large corporations, including, yes, the oil companies and uh, a few others, how utterly rapacious and ruinous the, the economic policies they would put in under the rubric and name of free markets and capitalism and fighting the communists. Well, I haven't and, read the book, but I will say this. Aren't they the absentee landlord we were just discussing? They, yeah, yeah, they're, they're even worse. I mean, I'm saying if they, if, they own, if they own and work land in, let's say, South America or the Middle East, but they're not there. Oh, yeah. We just exploit it. Now, oh, he goes why, into it. Now, what's the alternative, though? If, if, if the alternative is the local socialists take it over, as the Mexicans did, as the, as the, as the, as the Mesoamericans did, or, or as the, uh, Venezuela did, that's worse. Okay, so there has to be a third alternative. There does. Those two, those two, those two cannot be the only alternatives. Unbridled individualism is just well the other side of the coin of unbridled uh, collectivism. That's right. And, and if you believe in God, you don't believe in either of those things are the highest good. You no. think there's something else even higher. That's that right. You have to that you're answerable to that you're responsible to. So let's let's let, let me emphasize. Although I am a ardent pro capitalist, I believe what Adam what you quoted Adam Smith as saying is that. It's only a system that can work for a morally, a morally advanced people, for morally upright people. The same way I also think it's true of, of the voting system. I, I, think a, I think a vote given to people who are not, don't have a tradition of Republican thinking, don't have a tradition of Christianity, of Christian thinking, are not necessarily going to produce a democratic society. No, they're not, because even in a democratic society, unless most, at least, uh, you know, a, a, a stable plurality at minimum holds to certain values and you know that you'll be hurt long term if you ignore those values. Yeah, you're lost. If you put the almighty dollar or the almighty whatever at the top where God's supposed to go, you're going to turn evil. The almighty and, dollar in the case of the one side of the coin. If you go the almighty. The almighty will of the people in case the other side of the coin. Those are the two sides of the coin. I was just yeah, that's about. what I was going to say, because yeah. you can do collective voluntary action to help people. People do it all the time, especially in churches. Um, but um, if you just 
try to get people to do group action um, because you think this is what's in everybody's interests. And then you have to start destroying everybody who doesn't agree with you what's in, in, in the best interest. You wind up in the same place. Ultimately, you wind up trying to hold up onto power or whatever you've already accumulated. And the thing is, you're eventually going to die. Um, and well, the, the, hideous thing about, the hideous thing about the other side of the coin, which we haven't dwelt on, we've criticized the free market and we've criticized the Republican form of government for a bit now. But let's look at the, what the problem on the other side, the fundamental problem on the other side is, if there's no law higher than, than, than human law, then power is the only thing there is. Yes. Because the powerful get to say what is true and what is false. There's no such thing as truth. There's only what That's the powerful right. say. And they can force you, and if they can force you to say their truth, then your truth doesn't count anymore. Now, if you believe in God or any kind of God, even if you believe in the gods of of the Aztecs, you, you're not going to buy that nonsense of the only truth is that there is no truth. Yeah. You know, even the Aztecs, as gross as they were, didn't didn't believe that power was the only human relationship between all human institutions and all human people. But the way the the way the collectivists talk, that is what they believe. Even even romantic relationships between men and women, they see in terms of a power struggle between the oppressive man oh. and the oppressed women. Okay. I know. I know. Friendships, they think friendships are power struggles. Language, they think language is a power struggle. Art, they think art is a power struggle. <laughs> now do you get now do you get to why these people cannot solve the problem with their model of the universe? Everything's they, a struggle. And there's no answer. It's it's a struggle, it's a Darwinian struggle where you cannot suddenly have a peace treaty between the wolves and the sheep. There's no, no you can have a peace treaty between two rational individuals. On a sunny day, when there's when there's plenty to eat, and you know, you can be a libertarian on a on a on, during peacetime, right? But during war emergency, you can't. They're not they're not socially useful enough for societies to to cohere. And if society doesn't cohere, you're not going to all march and step during wartime. And if you and if you can't do that in wartime, then you're going to be conquered by someone who can do it. Okay, as someone once said, as a famous famous comedian once said, I can imagine a world with love peace and understanding and no, and no and no and no idea of aggression and no idea of warfare and we can take them we could conquer them in an afternoon yeah but humans don't just work just don't work that way i think I, don't work that way. this is this is one of the reasons why I, I i see this with a lot of people some people can never get off of it and even young you know, a lot of young men coming through the server want to want to want to argue liber you know Markets versus socialism, and everybody's got their, their 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 favorite thing. And I'm like, guys, you know, these terms are really loose. Ultimately, without a, an overriding set of values beyond the dollar or beyond yeah. the material, you're going to get lost. Because I mean, the only thing let, let, let me let me interrupt yet again. The only thing the capitalists and the socialists are arguing about is how to split up the loot. Okay, what to do it in the moral fashion, which is the capitalists are favor of, or the immoral fashion, which are the socialists are favor of. But man does not live by bread alone. If you can't see that, then you can't live. The, the, the thing that socialists seem to be arguing about are almost never economic issues. When's the last time you heard a public debate or even saw a public uh, newspaper article about anything that was actually an economic issue? Let's say something like whether or not a minimum wage causes unemployment. I haven't seen that. I haven't heard that debated recently. I hear debated whether or not men are oppressing women, whether or not whites are oppressing blacks. Whether or not do we have enough, whether or not we need more hate crimes, and so we have to fake them up in order to fulfill the, uh, in order to fill up the uh, the demand because the demand outstrips the supply. That's whether right. or not this person's is 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 uh, moral or immoral, whether or not this form of marriage is is right or wrong, is equal or unequal. These are all social and religious and philosophical questions. So, to my, with with all due respect to my libertarian and my objectivist friends. You keep talking as if the enemy, your enemy and mine, are actually worried about the economy. They could care less about the economy. They don't care about the economy. They want power. Yep. The reason they want power is because power is their god. They yep. live in this hellish world, a world of their own imaginations, where every human being is locked in a life or death struggle with every other human being. Every class is against every other class. Every race is against every other race. And the two sexes are against each other. And the straights are against the, the homosexuals. Everyone hates everyone else. And everyone is trying to, to, to dominate, to exploit the weak. Okay? 
and there's no and there's no white flag. There's no peace treaty. There's no armistice. There's no. no there is no peace possible between these groups. No, that's the worldview these guys live in. And the only thing they say is we should help the underdog. Well, I don't know why in the world you would help the underdog if there's nothing in the world but power and its struggle. But that's like it's they they talk like the demons in in C.S. Lewis's screw tape letters, where there's nothing but power, there's no kind emotion between people, there's no just there's no justice, there's no such thing as objective justice. If you don't believe in the truth, then you can't believe in justice. If you don't think there's a, if you don't believe in objective reality, then you don't believe in objective morality. And if you don't believe in objective morality, you can't believe this thing is just and unjust. No, nope. what people call justice is only the strong dominating the weak. And the strong, the strong say whatever we want is just. That's the world they live in, and it's a nightmare world. No wonder these people are always upset. No wonder they're always angry. No wonder they're always afraid. They, they talk about how afraid they are of, of political figures who will never do them even the slightest harm. How afraid they are of the Christians coming to round them up and ship them off to to internment camps or something. Though no Christian I know has ever even spoken of such a thing or even thought about it. And the reason why they're so afraid all the time and so angry all the time is because their God is a Darwinian power struggle to the death. And there's which, nothing beyond death. There's no happy ending, no matter what they do in their lives. Which I'll also say, again, we're, we're picking on both sides. And by the way, we're running out of time, but I, we pick on both sides. But I've met many a, a free-floating libertarian or says he's into market principles. But it's pretty clear that... The word competition means more to him than anything else. And he's there in that to, to just, he who with the most toys wins, basically. He who dies with the most toys wins, basically. I've seen that mentality. And it's yeah, just right. as toxic to him in the, in the long run. It's just as toxic. It doesn't work I'll tell you why. Because you can use that to justify any enormity or any crime. You can use that to justify yep. pornography. You can yep. say pornography is something that buyers want to buy. And who are you to denounce their, their choices as evil? And you can say, well... Prostitution should be illegal. Well, I'm sorry. If you say prostitution should be legal, you are an enemy of womankind. <laughs> you hate women, whether you know it or not, because those women who do that, they don't live good lives, and they're not in that lifestyle voluntarily. No. Uh, you know what I'm there saying? Are no happy, there are no happy hookers. Some of them will pretend they are. They lie. They almost always wind up bitter, miserable, alone, and diseased, or suiciding, or yeah, overdosing. Right. And yeah, it's right. not just women who get caught up in it either. But in any case, yes, it, absolutely. It, I mean, it, you can name all kinds of things. The bottom line, though, is that really, if you're in that free-floating, it's all about he who dies with the most toys wins, I got the most stuff, your odds of dying really miserable are really, really high. Also, your your odds of being taken out by one of your competition and destroyed are also really, yeah, really high, it's a, it's a especially problem. if they're unconstrained by any moral sense. And what do you do? And what do you do if you lose everything? What do you do yeah. at the end of your life? You look around and you see, and you see nothing but a pile of dust. Well, a Christian could be happy in that circumstance, and you can't be. Yeah. Even a Buddhist could be happier than you because. Yep. You've you've devoted your life to something that doesn't actually fit the human psychology. It's not actually going to make you happy. Nope. Hiring a series of whores to, to pleasure you is not going to make you as happy as a loving wife. I'm sorry, you, we're not we're not built that way. You might think you can adjust your brain to make yourself able to live off of eating gravel and mud, but you can't. You nope. can't live off of hate, and you can't live off of indifference, and you can't live off of money. It doesn't make you. Now, what money does is it solves it solves it, it, it eliminates unhappiness. It eliminates problems. You know, it eliminates. It, there are things you can fix and things you can do that you can't do without money. Fine. Even Christians who say that the uh, love of money is the root of all evil don't say it's not there for some good. We just think the good it's supposed to do is to help your neighbor. In fact, you just hit it. This is one. You know, some will stupidly say money is the root of all evil. No. What does the scriptures actually say? The love, love of money. money, and once money and is your I God, believe, I believe what the scriptures talking about there is: what are you going to put at the top of your pyramid? What is going to be the God in your life? Yeah, that's if right. You make it money. Money is a cold God, and He's not going to come to you when you're sick. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Let's keep. He's not going to. He's not going to cure your guilt when you feel guilty. Yeah. Um, not going to cure your remorse, not going to cure your regrets. Oh, I have no regrets. Well, then there must be something wrong with you, really. <laughs> then there's something wrong with you, yeah. Yeah, let's... let's... Now, well, most of these things, most of these ideas, the reason why students are the guys who are always pressing for communism, and students are the guys usually who are who are all, are all uh, in favor of libertarianism, 
and no 90 year old capitalist who owns uh, 15 giant international companies is ever libertarian is, <laughs> is because these are simplistic answers to world co- to life's complicated questions. The simplistic answer to to uh, on the on the objectivist side is whatever reason and whatever individual selfish willpower says is the answer. Whatever I want is the answer as long as I'm not hurting someone else. And the communists say whatever the will of the people is is the answer, whether the will of the people is corrupt or not corrupt. They don't even have excuse me. They don't even have a word in their vocabulary for what happens when it, when a group of people goes mad for when a whole nation is insane. But we've seen that. We saw it in Nazi Germany. We saw it in the Soviet Union, and we're seeing it these days in America. But there's a whole group of people who can't tell the difference between right and wrong, left and right, up and down, male and female. Uh, uh, they can't tell the difference between between uh, unparalleled social mobility and a case system. They can't tell the difference between poverty and affluence. They can't tell the difference between satisfying lives and alienation. They can't tell the difference between exploitation and mutual benefit. You wind up completely lost with no idea of God. And we really need right. to wrap up. If we believe it or not, we have passed our hour, so we need to cut it. Got a final thought, Mr. Wright? I do. The reason why everything that's wrong in the world, you cannot solve the problem without God, is that the thing that causes the world's problems, the thing that causes the disease, is it's, it's a disease that attacks the roots of the tree. When you put something in your heart, as your highest value, as your as your main driver, as your prime mover. If the prime mover is not God, then it's going to be something that will turn on you, It'll turn to an idol. And it's always a good thing. It's always a thing that starts good, but then when you go slowly go crazy, like like Uncle George, it turns into it turns into a devil, and it turns on you and rends you. Even liberty, even something as fine and shining as liberty, will turn on the objectivist and turn her into an adulterer. And she'll lead a miserable life and she'll die unhappy. Even something as fine and noble as charity to the poor will turn on the Stalinist and turn and rip him to shreds. And he'll end up naked next to a wall being shot in the head by the secret police. So you can't tell me there's something so good and so noble, but you can put it above the mystical view that only religious people can have of what man's place in the universe is. You can't see where man is supposed to stand if your point of view is inside man. I agree. And my for my final thought is, is that if you're, yeah, I mean, nobody's here is telling you come to Jesus right now, but learn some respect for the Christian ethic, for the Christian worldview. Learn some kind of idea of God, even if it's vague. Go study from some, some Socrates first. Um, it really right. will help you right. figure out there is such a thing as right and wrong. And really, when you when you take that that seemingly liberating step of saying, I can figure out what's right and wrong because I are smart. And I'm I'm clever. I can figure out what's right and wrong. I'll make everybody happy. That's when you're probably doomed. And that's why godless philosophies, secular philosophies, are always going to fail you personally eventually, and they're always going to fail uh, society eventually, Amen. like what we're seeing now. So I'll tell you what. Let's like close this up. It. Tomorrow night we're doing nerd streams. So we're going to talk about science fiction and comic books and stuff. So that's going to be great. Um, we are here. Uh, I forget who we have for our guests coming up this week, but we have a couple of that we've booked. So um, please do us a favor and give us a like, give us a subscribe, hit that bell, visit us on redpillreligion.com, uh, buy some of our merchandise or leave us a tip, visit scifiright.com and buy some of uh, John C. Wright's awesome fiction. And uh, God bless everybody. <laughs>